I uh, uh, had a great privilege of speaking here last week. Um, had a lot of fun with you all, and um, and here we go again. So, um, for those of you who don't know me. Um, uh, we live here in Sardinia. Uh, this is our home church, and I'm proud to call it that. Um, uh, my wife, Julie, and I have been married for 10 years, and we have two wonderful kids and another one. Don't act like you don't have favorites. Come on. I'll pray for you. You know, like, you're not supposed to, and I wouldn't tell them, but they're not in here. They're over there. So, <clears throat> but let's, uh, I'm going to try not to trip over chords. If I do, I'm going to apologize to the band and write a check. Um, so, let me, let me pray for us. Uh, Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for the gift of your word um, that we can understand what you'd have us to know about you and how much you love us. We know that without the Holy Spirit, we could, it'd be impossible for us to understand it. So we thank you for that gift that he would speak to us and guide us into truth. And so today, would you help us to rightly understand your word? Would you help us to rightly live it out as we leave this place, as we go into our homes and communities, into our workplaces, would we shine like stars? Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. As the red and yellow hues of the Middle Eastern sunset crested the final hill, someone in the room lit a couple candles. The meal had been over, and they sat there lounging, talking. Every year they did this meal, but this year was different. This year was a little strange. The master seemed off. He, he seemed distracted. Something was on his mind, but they didn't understand what it was. Not only did he seem distracted, he was acting in a weird way. In the middle of the meal, he, he got up, and he took off his outer cloak, and he knelt down and washed their feet. This was unheard of. The master didn't do this. That was the slave's job. During the meal, he had taken the familiar elements of the bread and the wine that they have known for a thousand years what those meant to represent God's promise and sacrifice. And he took them and he reoriented them around himself. And he said, this is my body that's broken. This is my blood spilled for you. And not only that, as he was teaching them, and you're holding on to every word that he'd say, he's teaching them, he's talking about that he'd be leaving, which surprised them to no end. What do you mean you're leaving? Where are you going? Can we go with you? Jesus was leaving. But in this teaching, he said it was actually better if he left because he would send a helper. He would send someone who would guide them into all truth. What do you, what do you mean you're leaving? Isn't it, isn't it better? Isn't it better for you to stay? I know often we sing songs and we say, just give me Jesus. All I need is Jesus. And the fact is, is Jesus says it's actually better if I go. But why? He says a helper is coming. And today we were going to talk about who that helper is. If you're just joining us, we started last week a series on the book of Acts and Acts is a book all about how the church began and then how we're supposed to live today as the church. But see, the book of Acts poses a problem for us because when I look at it and I read the events that happened there and then I compare it to my Christian life today, I see a gap. From what I see and should expect in Scripture to the way my life is, it doesn't match up. And if I were to just have the Word of God and not a church history... I would expect much different things from my day-to-day -day life as a Christian. Last week, we talked about how everything hinged on one thing, the resurrection. That if the resurrection didn't happen, then we are to be pitied, Paul says. Today, we're going to be talking about the event that changed everything. You see, in the Gospel of John, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit and says it's better if he leaves because he will send the Holy Spirit to help us. 
In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says his disciples will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And after that, in the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus ascends into heaven and the disciples are left standing there wondering what they're to do next. Jesus told them to wait until the Holy Spirit came. I can't even imagine the tension. Maybe you have somebody in in your life, maybe it is you that just can't sit still. You have to do something. And you ever had guests coming over and you've wiped down the counter four times just because you're, you're nervous about them coming? I know it's the frustration, the hurry up and wait. To just sit and wait and wait. Knowing something would come. And the message that we have will change the world, but Jesus told us to wait. Imagine the frustration. I think being a world changer gets a lot of press these days. Especially working with uh, students, Uh, and young men for the last few years, I I think we talk a lot about, you can be a world changer. You can change your community. You can change everything that happens around you. And we do this in the name of Jesus. And the reality is, is that when I look at Jesus' teachings, I see two things that it takes to change in the world. So you have some fill in the blanks on your outline if you receive that when you walked in. It takes two things to change the world. The first is obedient people. It takes obedient people to change the world. Matthew writes at the end of his gospel, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You can do everything. That Jesus has given all power and now he's given it to you. You can do everything. But the reality is you can't do it alone. Point two, it takes two things. It takes obedient people and it takes the Holy Spirit. I will be with you. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit as a Christian lives and dwells inside of you now. And we don't know where he comes from or when he comes. We just see the results. It's like the wind. I can just see the results of a storm that passed through, the tree branch that's down, the shingles that are lifted. Obedient people in the Holy Spirit, this is what it takes to change families, homes, cities, towns, counties. We can't do it alone. John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. John 16, 7, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so this is what brings us to Acts chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles with you, I hope you open up to Acts chapter 2. The disciples are waiting for something, and I'm guessing they aren't quite sure what they're waiting for. No one had seen this happen. There are very few people in the Old Testament, their recorded history, that were described as having the Spirit of God on them. A few of the prophets, David at one point, the Spirit of God coming them, an advocate, a helper. I wonder what they thought would happen. And so this is where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2. It's that they are sitting in a house all gathered together, and we learn that it's about 120 people sitting in a room, waiting and praying. And as they're sitting there, Scripture tells us that a violent wind came into the room, and what appeared to be tongues of fire, flames split, and went on them. And as that, they started being able to speak in different languages. And so uh, they left there and went out, and this was the time of a um, festival called Pentecost. And Pentecost would actually bring um, thousands of people into the city. This, the city would kind of explode with, um, uh, with activity during this time. From all over the Roman Empire, people would come in for this festival. And so the fact that the Holy Spirit gives them the ability to speak in these different languages, that they are hearing their own language, isn't surprising. It was the right time at the right place because they were obedient. And so let's read this. Acts chapter 2, 
uh, starting in verse 1 through 12. He says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they said, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then he starts listing them, Parthians, Medes, Almites, I'm, I don't, I'm not pronouncing these right, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Ferga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of uh, Libya, near Cyrene, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. So basically he's listing everybody that's anything in the Roman Empire. And he says, <clears throat> um, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? The Holy Spirit comes and gives the disciples an amazing gift which kicks off something that would change the world forever. And so what is the Holy Spirit? Better stated, who is the Holy Spirit? So Holy Spirit 101, you have some points to fill in. Number one, he is God, the provider of spiritual knowledge and power. The Holy Spirit is part of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Now, you won't find the word Trinity in your scriptures, but the teaching is there. And I'm not even going to pretend like I understand the Trinity. That is uniquely different, but one. And we'll say, well, maybe it's, maybe it's like an egg. All right, so you have the yolk and the white and the shell. But the problem is, it's like, wow, it's one egg. If you serve me eggs and there's a shell in it, I'm, I don't want it. Right? I, I, I don't know about you. I cannot figure out how to crack an egg without getting at least one little shell in it. Right? But we don't want that in there. And so it's, it's not like an egg. We say, well, maybe it's like, it's like water. The Trinity's like water. Right? So there's three parts of water, uh, ice, liquid, gas, right? Solid, liquid, gas. There we go. Um, I'll get it. Um, I went to Bible college. Give me a break. Um, and so with that, we say, well, maybe, maybe it's like water. Well, the problem is, is that those are three different states. They're not all of that at one time. I, I think what we, happens when we get to the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we can't say how it works because all we have is analogy. It's like something. We actually learn what something is by what it's like. So anything new, we have to say, well, it's like that. Oh, okay. Now I start to understand. The problem with the Trinity is there's nothing like it. It's a, we call it maybe a fourth dimensional truth. We live in a three-dimensional world. Imagine for a second, if you will, you live in a two-dimensional world. It's just flat. And then through that two-dimensional world, something shows up like this and comes through into your world. What would you make of that? I, I can't explain it. I, I don't understand what's going on in that moment. There's no place in my brain where this makes sense. And so as we get to it, if we think it's a fourth dimensional world, we live in three dimensions. I have depth. I can understand this, but if it's outside of that, I have no concept of what's going on. See, we can't use analogy to describe what God is like because God isn't like anything else. We don't understand things that are outside of our three dimensions, and I firmly believe that this is how God functions. I really hope that someday we get a grasp, just a glimpse of it. You see, for many of us with the Holy Spirit, if he gives us all spiritual knowledge and power, a lot of us with our talents and skill sets, experience and education, Many of us are quite capable of living successfully according to the world's standards without the power of the Holy Spirit. But I will tell you this, that you cannot, cannot live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus didn't do his ministry without the Spirit. He was baptized and we're told that the Spirit descended like a dove. The Spirit would rest on him. 
So how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? I would say if you've ever been able to understand Scripture, that's the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. If you've ever seen acts of power or something bizarre happening, we go, oh, that's coincidence. No, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, Christian. The Spirit of God is at work. The Bible is the work of the Holy Spirit inspiring people to write. We don't have it on your screens. If you want to write 2 Timothy 3.16 on your outlines, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's really Spirit-breathed. Scripture helps us to be controlled by the Spirit. You want spiritual knowledge? You want power? It starts here in getting this. And the thing is, is that we will pray, and I'm at fault for this, and I will sit here and I'll go, God, please give me wisdom. All the while, this collects dust. Do I want to know what he says? I have to open up the Bible. Because the reality is, is that we all know some wonky things that have been said from people who say, oh, God spoke to me and did this. And I'm not discounting God can do that. But we need to test that against Scripture. If not, then you start a cult. You have to test it against Scripture. This is not just a tool. It is the measuring rod for all truth to understand. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 5, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Christian, let me encourage you, if you're afraid to talk about your faith, Paul did not use, Paul, one of the most famous Christians in all the world, did not use wisdom or persuasive words to convince people. It was the Spirit working through him. You say, oh, I don't know enough. Oh, I don't, I'm not smart enough. That had nothing. You, you know, your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. He continues in verse 14 through 16. He says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord? So as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. The Spirit gives you spiritual knowledge and power. And without it, you will read this and go, this is stupid. The reality is the message of the gospel isn't just to make your life better, but says to die to yourself, take up your cross daily, and become a slave to Jesus. To which many of us have said, yeah, sign me up. But then we live in a way as if it was the Willy Wonka golden ticket into heaven. I got that, I'm good. I'll just sit back. And the reality is, is that unless we have the Spirit in us, we cannot rightly understand these words. That the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom to understand what he's saying. We need the Spirit. So how do we get the Spirit? Point number two, we receive the Spirit when, and you're, you don't have a lot of room, become a Jesus follower. You may have to wrap it around. And we become a Jesus follower. Ephesians 1, Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise and his glory. So this is like when you go and try to get a loan from the bank and they ask if you have any collateral. It's a seal, it's a guarantee. You want to know if you've truly been saved? It's the power and work of the Holy Spirit present in your life. That you have the Holy Spirit, you have been saved. Romans 8, 9 says, And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So every Christian has the Spirit. You go, oh, I, I, I don't know, I haven't experienced that. If you have submitted your life to Christ... You have been buried with him in baptism, raised to new life in him. I guarantee you, Scripture tells us, guarantee you have the Spirit of God. 
Now it's learning to walk in that. The reality is, is over 10 years ago, Julie and I stood right here on this stage and made vows to each other. And I was roughly 24 years old and knew everything there was to know about marriage and Julie as I stepped in, right? <clears throat> but the reality is, is as I stood roughly about here and watched her come down the aisle, my life would be radically changed forever. That I went from being 24 years of just me to now figuring out how to love and serve her. And so all of a sudden, I stepped into a new reality. And I had to learn how to live in that reality now. I went from instantaneously being a bachelor to being married. Comes with a different set of rules, doesn't it? And I had to learn that. And we've been married 10 years, eight of which have been fantastic. Because I didn't learn that. Because I still wanted to live like Bachelor Robbie. I still wanted to stay up, hang out with friends, go out. Oh, I got things to do, place to do. And then we had a kid, and I left her with the kid. And I was like, you got this. I'm working so hard. You got this. She didn't like that. I thought that was a little ridiculous. She's nodding her head in the balcony right now. I didn't tell her I was going to talk about that, so I'm going to be in trouble later. So if you don't see me next week, call the cops. Um, but the reality is, is instantaneously, I went from one identity to a new identity, and I still look the same, right? And so as we become a Christian, as we step over from sinner into what Scripture calls us the saints, as we make that step over because of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, as we step into that new life, we have to learn what it means to live in that new identity. And that's going to mean we start acting different. We're going to start seeing that maybe in our language that we use. It's interesting, when I worked with the men on the ranch out in California, um, rough guys, most of them recovering drug addicts, the first thing I would start seeing that when they would change and accept Christ, the first change I would start to see is their mouth. Their language would change. Now, I'm not just talking about cussing. I'm talking about the way they would actually encourage guys. The way they pour into people. The way they all of a sudden start giving up things. And then their actions change. So now they're starting to offer shoes off their feet to guys who didn't have anything when they came. To which the new guys who come in are like, what in the world is going on? Never had anybody do this for me. Living a life in the Spirit will radically change that. And it happens when we become a follower of Jesus. I guarantee you, if you have given your life to Jesus, that you have the Spirit in you. Are you learning to walk in what that means? Is your life different from the way it was yesterday, a year ago, 10 years ago? How's your life different? Are you getting more, seeing more fruit of the Spirit, as Paul writes in Galatians? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Are you seeing those poured out in you? Man, old me would have lit you up right now if you had acted that way. Old me would have looked out for number one. I would have taken mine. New me, ooh, now I'm patient. I don't understand why I'm being patient. Old me would have punched you in the face right now. Oh, no. Now I'm turning the other cheek. Why? Why am I doing everything about the way I was raised? My dad told me to punch him back. Some of you are laughing because that may be your history. And people will think you're a fool. A fool. Look at Acts 2, 37 through 39. So the end of the chapter now. So Paul, or excuse me, Peter preaches this amazing sermon. He goes out, he gets everyone's attention. And, and it's a lot of Old Testament themes. He's talking to Jews and he's speaking about the coming Messiah and what happens. And it's interesting in verse 37, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, and I love the confidence of this. Peter, a man who just uh, a, a month earlier had disowned Jesus, denied him three times, 
and was brought back in the fold now stands and boldly preaches to a crowd of thousands of people. And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's you and me. That we repent. I'm going this way. I'm no longer going that way. I'm turning back around. That we're baptized into water and the water is waiting. To give your life to Jesus, that you submit yourself and you get to share in his death, to bury it in the water his burial, and then ultimately his resurrection. And I love the first sign of breath as they come out of the water. One of the most amazing times I had is a chance to baptize at the ranch, a man named James. Uh, James came from a very tough past. And I don't think I realized just how tough it was until we were standing at the pool for him to be baptized and he takes off his shirt and he has a swastika tattoo on his stomach. And I lean in and say, what's that, man? Like, I I would have been baptized with my shirt on. And he says, man, it was just an old life. I'm ready for new. And to see a man submit himself and give up that old life that he had tattooed himself with, he gave it all up because there's something greater waiting for him on the other side. Becoming a follower of Jesus means obeying him, and we do this through baptism. Baptism. When we commit to Jesus, we're baptized, and then we receive the Holy Spirit. So what does this look like? Point three, sometimes it's spectacular, but sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's spectacular, sometimes it's subtle. And we see this happen with, in the Old Testament, and you have there uh, 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. Elijah is in the cave, and he's just come off of a mountaintop experience where against the showdown against the prophets of Baal. And in this, then, He wins and defeats. They kill all these false prophets. And then the queen doesn't like what happened. And so he finds himself depressed, hungry, exhausted, hiding in a cave. And God shows up. And God sends a wind and an earthquake and then fire. But God isn't in any of those. And then finally, a small, gentle whisper comes. And God is in the whisper. See, each of us, I think, have a leaning towards how we like to experience God. Some of us love the spectacular. We got more of that charismatic bent. Yeah, that's how God functions. I can't believe how spiritually dead all you are, that you're just sitting there. I can't believe that. Right? On the other side, we like the subtle. I can't believe they're raising their hands right now. Oh, my gosh. I'm so embarrassed for them. (laughs) And the thing what we do is we start making camps of those two. So I like the spectacular, so I'm going to hang out with other people who like the spectacular. And we say, that's how God moves, and then we judge all the subtle people. And the subtle people over here, we're like, I'm so embarrassed for them. We hang out here, we just read our Bible, and we keep our hands to ourselves. And the thing is, is that if we are seeking the spectacular, or we're afraid of the spectacular, we're seeking or afraid of the wrong thing. Because just in chapter 2 of Acts, we see both. We see the spectacular And by the end, we see the subtle. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. The rushing wind comes, an explosive event. And then we see the daily grind by the end. And the spirit is working in both. I think for many of us, and I know myself included, I've experienced God in some amazing events. I think about growing up and going to camp and oh, it's camp high, conference highs, all these. We've had those highs, right? Go to a revival. Oh, it was so great. And then Monday hits, and i got to live out the grind. If we keep going back trying to recreate a mountaintop experience, we will miss how God is working in the sludge of the valley. God is at work in his people. He's at work in you right now. And we have to be obedient, and we have to have the Holy Spirit. 
So how do we do this? So two take-home lessons from Acts 2 as I wrap up here. Some of you are saying, thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Number one, to be filled with the Spirit, we have to stop, listen, and follow the Spirit. We have to take time to stop for a second. I think one of Satan's greatest things he's done to stop us as Christians is making us so busy. Look at your calendar. Say, oh, I just don't have time. Let me challenge you this week. Five minutes a day. Five minutes. Open up the scripture. Read a paragraph and then say, God, what would you have me learn from this today? Five minutes. I'm not asking for superhero moves because I think some of us will go, and I'm in this, oh, I can't do it for an hour, why bother? Don't be a superhero. Remember, this isn't about trying harder. It's about trusting fully. God, what would you have me learn from this today? Five minutes a day. For some of you, maybe you're already doing that. Add a little bit. Stop and listen. Maybe for a second, you're going to start your car, drive your commute to work, and not have the radio on. Your podcast, your music, your talk show, all will be there the next day. What would happen if you just spent that drive just talking to God? God, I'm, I'm going in a place that I feel like maybe you're not, and I need help. Number two, and finally, following the Spirit means making the most of every opportunity. If we say we want to follow him and we want to submit, do not ask for that unless you want to follow through. Because you're going to have an opportunity, a chance, that God's going to give you, and he's going to give you the power to respond in that through his Holy Spirit. Are you open to that? To make the most of every opportunity. Listen to the gentle nudging of the Holy Spirit this week. What's he calling you to do? Who's he calling you to talk to? How's he calling you to live? What's he calling you to stop doing in order to follow him more fully? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you left so that we could have the Holy Spirit dwell inside of us, the power of the living God inside of us. Jesus, help us to not take that for granted. Help us to see the truth that you would have us see in Scripture. Help us to right now, as your Spirit is speaking to us about that person we need to talk to, the thing we need to stand up against, the thing we need to do, because you are leading us into that. Help us to have the power to do that, Jesus. So I pray all these things in your name. Amen.